Uh, let's open our Bibles uh, again this afternoon to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And we shall um, continue where, from, uh, where we left off this morning. But uh, let's just do a little bit of a summary first. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, let's look at verse 9 and 10. And then verse, uh, sorry, chapter 3, verse 11. So chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now chapter 3, verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus and the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for being able to uh, gather again this afternoon. And, Lord, uh, we know that uh, afternoons tends to be just the core group. And, uh, Father, I just do pray, though, that, Lord, you would, uh, would speak to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for those that are here. And, uh, Lord, I just pray that the Word of God would speak to each and every one of us Lord, me included, uh, Lord, through the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, Lord, for it is, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And Father, I just do pray that you would uh, help us to uh, understand, to uh, to gather uh, all that you would have us to, to understand, Lord, from your Word. And uh, Father, we thank you and praise you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, <clears throat> um, this morning we started looking at uh, the, these three characters. We looked at uh, Peter this morning. We look at uh, uh, John and Paul this afternoon. And uh, you might say, why do we need to consider these three if we're, if we're looking at uh, the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord? Well, uh, you know, uh, if we desire to be used of the Lord to the fullest extent that the Lord, Lord would have in, in your life, in, in my life, then if we combine the character of these three men, it gives us a picture of the ultimate Christian. Uh, you know, each had particular qualities which stood out uh, in their lives. And, uh, and the, more we can, the more we can be shaped and molded uh, like these guys, uh, like Peter, John, and Paul, then uh, the more we're going to be uh, able to be used of the Lord in respect of his eternal purpose. And you know, uh, that's what it's all about. Yeah, you're thinking about Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, there about that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. I mean, when that time comes in the future, uh, it's not going to be about how successful we were, we, we were physically in life. Not at all. Um, and uh, let me say this, there are some, some churches out there that that's, that's the measure of success for them, how, how well off their, their members are. Uh, that's not what it's about. Not at all. It's, it's about how successful we are as a church and individually in the eternal purpose of God. It should be our purpose in life. And, uh, and yes, of course, we've got, to, we've got to work jobs, we've got to have, you know, raise families, etc., etc., etc. But at the same time, uh, if we are really getting a hold of our walk with the Lord, it's all ultimately about God's eternal purpose. Uh, because one day we're, we're all going to breathe our last, we're going to step into God's presence, and, uh, and, and, and that'll be it. Our chance to serve God will be finished. And it's very easy in this life that we live, especially at the time that we live in at the moment, um, it's very easy to be distracted from that. Uh, you know the uh, the physical conditions of, of the world at this time, uh, and you know e every time you get talking to somebody, it's it's about what's happening in the world, whether it be the virus, whether it be uh, what's happening in America, whether it be the Chinese, whether it be the finances of the world, uh, whatever. You know, there's so many issues there, and uh, it's so easy to take our, our eyes off the fact that all of those things that, that, that people are talking about physically are actually. Uh, you know, prophecy from the Word of God. Uh, you know, it's all been told, foretold that that's you know that the world will head this way, and so for us, 
that had the opportunity uh, in this country to serve God, um, let's not be self-serving, but let's be serving God in respect of His eternal purpose. You might say, well, I don't know how God wants me to serve Him according to His eternal purpose. Well, God knows. And that's why you've got to, that's why what we're looking at today is important. Because if we are, if we are letting God uh, mould us and shape us to to change to change our direction like he did, like Peter was willing to be uh, to have done to him, uh, even though he had a bit of a hiccup there on the night the Lord was betrayed. Nonetheless, Peter was willing to be corrected, moulded, and shaped into into what God wanted him to be. And uh, and then you know as we as we look at uh, with John and Paul, you know we'll, we'll have great faith and zeal in our lives. And and uh, John, uh, the ultimate picture of a Christian with his with his meekness and long-suffering gentleness, etc. Uh, you know, that, that's what's important. And so, uh, let's have a look at, uh, at these things this afternoon. And, and uh, though we may never reach the heights of, of, of Peter and, and John and, and Paul, uh, nonetheless, uh, it would sure be a, a, a transformed Christian with a renewed mind that we would become if we allow the Lord to work in our lives uh, as, we, as we've been looking at today. So the second person that we're looking at is Paul. And uh, Paul's character displayed the fervor and faith that we need to have in our lives if we are to serve the Lord to the fullest extent. And let's just remember, what was Peter? Peter was someone that was willing to be corrected, molded and shaped uh, by the Lord. Uh, and, uh, and that brought confidence in his walk with Christ. Instead of being self uh, assured of him, you know, in other words, being sure of himself, uh, he was. He then became sure in Christ uh, of his walk with the Lord. And you just, you've only got to read the post ascension of Christ, the life of Peter after the Lord ascended, to see that uh, it was there was great transformation there. And so Paul, Paul displayed the fervor and faith that we need to have in our lives if we are to serve the Lord to the fullest extent. Now let's go to Acts chapter twenty. Acts chapter twenty. Now. Let me say this, this is Paul on his way to Jerusalem. Yes, we've looked at this a number of times. Uh, Paul was going there when the Lord said not to go, etc., uh, etc. Et but nonetheless, we can look at Paul here in verses 22 to 24 and to see the heart of the man. We can see the heart of Paul. In Acts 20, verses 22 to 24, uh, Paul wrote that, or said, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, Say that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither can I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel uh, of the grace of God. What, what's the, to testify the gospel of the grace of God? What's that? God's eternal purpose. And, uh, and you can see that, you can see the zeal, and you can see the faith there in that. Uh, Paul was not concerned about what was going to happen. He knew that bonds and afflictions would abide in him. There. The Holy Spirit of God was telling him that. It didn't move him. He literally says that. None of these things move him. Why? Because Paul had great faith in his Lord, in his Saviour. And uh, not that I'm encouraging anyone here. I'm not encouraging anyone here to go and do something silly. To try and to try and uh, be a witness for the Lord, not at all, not at all. But what I'm saying is, we can see here Paul's great zeal and faith in this in these verses, and uh, and nothing was going to nothing was going to change that. Now, obviously, in that day and age, it was a different different time. Uh, life was different in those times, different culture, different ways, and uh, and life wasn't uh, and life was a whole lot cheaper than what it is today in this country, at least. And, uh, and so, so the thing is, Paul is talking in that context. It, you know, he, the, 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 what he would suffer was, was not unusual in, in, uh, in, in life of people back in those days. Mind you, he's, he suffered a lot in comparison to others, but, but uh, he had great faith and great zeal. And, uh, and so, uh, if, if we have the willingness that Peter had to be corrected, and we see the Lord's working in that, uh, not chastisement, but working. Remember what I said this morning about the Comforter, the Holy Spirit? The Lord said that He would remind us, bring to remembrance of all things that He had said unto us, 
uh, unto them, I should say, unto the disciples. And, uh, and so Peter remind, remembered that just as he denied the Lord the third time and he heard the, heard the cock crow, he, you know, he remembered what the Lord had said that night. It was done as a, as a comfort to Peter. In other words, to help him. It wasn't to slap him about the face. It was to say, hey, Peter, remember I prayed for you that your faith would fail not. And so uh, uh, when, when we let the Lord work in our lives, if we had that willingness like Peter had, and, and we see the Lord working, it will help us to, to build our faith. It will help us to build our fervor for the Lord, uh, like Paul, like Paul. But let me say this, if, when you experience things in life, and, and you can see this in Paul, if you look, at, you look at Paul's life all the way through after salvation, no matter where he went, what he did, uh, he never flinched once in his faith. And uh, he, was, he was bold in his faith, he was very fervent in his faith, uh, in serving the Lord. And so you stop and think, the first missionary journey that Paul went on, he went with Barnabas, and Barnabas took him first of all to Cyprus. Now Cyprus was Barnabas' home, home island. That was where Barnabas was from. And so it was quite like the Lord let Barnabas take him there and then, then up to the mainland into what, what is today Turkey. And, uh, and, and it was kind of like the Lord was letting him have a training run, so to speak, in his first missionary journey. But nonetheless, when they got up to the mainland and they went to Lystra, what happened to Paul? Paul got stoned. You know, welcome to the ministry, Paul. Uh, you know, here, cop this, rock hockey. Your, head's the, your head is the target. And so, and so poor old Paul, you know, he, uh, he, didn't, he didn't flinch with that. What happened the next, he, he, he got thrown, his body got thrown out of, outside the city is dead, uh, there in Lystra. And then the Lord basically, you know, wasn't finished with him, he's only just begun. He's saying, come on, Paul, get up. And so Paul gets up, he wasn't, he wasn't dead. Uh, the, well, the Lord brought him back to life. And, uh, and it says that Paul went back into the city. He went back into the city. That's great faith. That's great zeal. That's great fervor. He wasn't doing anything to them, but they had it in for him. It takes great faith and great fervor to do that. So, what, so what, the reason why I brought that up is this. As Paul went through life, after his missionary life, after that incident, for example, I mean, how much more serious can you get? You've already been stoned to death. And it was only the grace of God that he was still alive, before that, that, that he came back to life, basically. And, uh, and so, uh, from that time on, Paul had a building block there of his faith, in his faith. You know, the Lord lets him experience that at the beginning. And I've said this to you before. When you experience something in your life, a problem, a trial, whatever it be, and God intervenes and helps you with that, you make that a building block in your, in your, in your faith. The Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Lord Jesus Christ is our foundation. Uh, it's talking there in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 11 to 15 about, about uh, the judgment seat of Christ, the rewards. But the Lord is our foundation in our lives. And when the Lord answers something, when, you, when the Lord gets you through a trial, when He gets you through a difficult time, when He answers whatever it may be, and you know it's the Lord, you, you make that a building block in your life. Don't forget it. You go, yep, I've, I've got that there, I'm not going to forget that. And, uh, and when the next time something else comes along, it might be something different, something bigger, something more major, but nonetheless, you look back and you go, well, God help me with that. And especially if it was a smaller thing. God help me with the small thing. Well, he's certainly going to help me with this. It builds your faith. It builds your zeal for the Lord. It builds your confidence in the Lord. And that's what we see with Paul. I mean, like I said, you know, he got stoned to death. Couldn't get any worse than that. And, uh, and, and, and so we see Paul just going on. Very faithful, very fervent in his walk with the Lord. Now, uh, I want to think back on this epistle to, to the church in, in Ephesus. We see here Paul write with great enthusiasm of God's eternal purpose in the verses that we've looked at this morning and, and this afternoon. Now this was around 60 to 62 AD. 60 to 62 AD. So by this time Paul had undergone three missionary journeys to the Gentile nations uh, to whom he was called. 
uh, spanning over two decades, uh, in, in excess of two decades. He had been persecuted in numerous ways, uh, suffered much hardship, uh, was at the time of writing a prisoner in Rome when he wrote the, the epistle to the, to the church at Ephesus. But by the hand of God, the blessing of God was clearly seen even as a prisoner. Uh, he had his own hired house. He was able to receive anyone uh, that, would, that would come in unto him, whether it be the Jews, whether it be Gentiles, whether it be other disciples coming in to see him and, and going out. He wrote four books of the New Testament uh, while being a prisoner there and, and went out, and those four books of the Bible went out to their destinations unhindered. And so, uh, you know, that is the hallmark of someone who had implicit faith in the Lord all the way through his life. You still think about Rome in those days. Rome, uh, for, you know, Roman Christians, nah, eh, eh, they, didn't, they didn't mix. And so we see the hand of God and Paul with his implicit faith after three, three missionary journeys, seeing God work time after time after time. You know, you still put yourself in, in uh, Philippi uh, the night that Paul and Silas had been whipped and thrown into jail. Uh, they're there, whip marks across the back, their legs are in stocks in the cell. Uh, and so at midnight they prayed and sang praises. That's someone with great faith. Well, that's two men with great faith and great zeal. Why? Because they understood that faith, real faith, moves the hand of God. Real faith moves the hand of God. And so uh, the Lord answered their faith. He answered the prayer and in prayers and, and singing of praise. And he sent the earthquake. The Philippian jailer got saved and his family. Uh, the next morning, uh, you know, after Paul said, you know, the authorities had to come and let him out, or ask him to leave, uh, off, they went, off they went for a man. And God had started the church uh, in Philippi, of course, with Lydia and her family before that as well. And so, you know, going back to Rome, so by the time of Rome, here he is in his own hired house, and he's just going, yep, that's God. Paul was very confident, very sure, very strong in his faith and in his zeal. And he was not afraid of, of you know, I've got to write, write this epistle, but how am I going to smuggle it out? No, no, no. He was able to receive. Let's have a look in Acts chapter 28. Acts 28. We see here the faith of Paul. Look at verse uh, 30, Acts chapter 28, verse 30. It says that Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. They were unhindered. Only God could do that right under Caesar's nose. Uh, you remember when, when Paul was going to Rome as a prisoner, uh, one of the times where uh, it was... Uh, when he was prisoner in Caesarea, the Lord said, "Fear not, Paul. You, know, you must be, you must come before Caesar." So, in other words, uh, before yeah, before Paul was on the journey to to Rome as a prisoner, the Lord confirmed that he would stand before Caesar. So, here he is in his own hired house. He stood before Caesar. God's given him his own hired house. He's receiving all that would come unto him. That's God. And Paul had this great faith after three journeys witnessing God time after time after time. He had this great faith and zeal still, uh, even despite all that happened. Now you stop and think about it. You put yourself in Paul's place. And I'll be honest, I'll be honest with myself. If you, if you experience all of what Paul had experienced by then, um, and this was this, when he wrote to uh, the church at, uh, at, at Ephesus, you know, he'd already experienced uh, the whippings, uh, five times from the Jews, uh, 39 stripes each time. He'd already experienced shipwreck. He'd already experienced stoning. He'd already experienced uh, riots. He'd been uh, persecuted by the Jews, etc., etc. You can look at the list in Corinthians, which is written uh, 50, I think about 57, 58 AD, I think from memory. And so, so, so the thing is, Paul by the time he wrote to the church at Ephesus, had even experienced more than that list that he put in the, in the epistle to the church at, at, uh, at Corinth. Now, you put yourself in Paul's place, 20 odd years of experiencing, let's say 20 years, of experiencing all that stuff. 
you reckon you'd be tired of it by then? I would. I'd be going, really, God? Haven't, haven't, I, haven't I copped enough already? How about a break? Yeah? Come on, time out. But not with Paul. Paul's going, it's cool. This is the hand of God. God gave him great peace because of his strong faith. And there he was in his own hired house. You know, the Jews came to him and uh, he was able to debate with the Jews about the Lord. Uh, they didn't go off to Caesar and say, hey, this guy in the cell down here, he's a, he's a heretic. No, no, no. no. And, uh, and Paul then went on and uh, we know that, that Paul uh, was released after his two, um, two years in his own hired house. And, uh, and he went on for another, another, another number of years, perhaps another five or six years. Now, let's have a think about that. His fervor and faith never shrunk through the years, even later that decade, uh, in his second imprisonment, when he knew that he would be martyred. Let's go to Acts chapter 23. I want to have a look at a couple of things here on the way to Acts, uh, to, uh, to when he's about to be martyred. Acts 23. Acts 23. Now in Acts chapter 23, we see Paul, he's been, um, he's been to Jerusalem, he's in, sorry, he's in Jerusalem. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees were trying to trying to kill him. Uh, the chief captain Roman, of the Roman soldiers, the centurions, he's got him. And uh, it says that they, they're taking him to the castle. And uh, they, they kept him in there. And have a look in chapter 23, verse 11. It says, The night following, uh, the Lord stood by him and said, uh, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. So the Lord stood by him and said, Yeah, good cheer, Paul. It's all, it's all good. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm with you. No problem. Now, go into Acts chapter 27. Acts 27. Paul's finally on his way after a couple of years' imprisonment in, uh, in Caesarea, or being held in Caesarea. Acts 27. He's on the ship. The ship runs into the storm, as we know. And uh, in verse 20, it says, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay up, lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Now, then verse 21, Paul gets up and starts to talk. Look at verse 22. It says, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. And so, uh, so we see in these two times, once, in, once there in, in uh, Jerusalem when, when they were trying to kill him, and the Roman centurions grabbed him, the Lord stood by him and said, it's, Don't be afraid, Lord, be of good cheer. Uh, and then the second time here on the ship, when they're, when they're you know, in that storm for a you know, good couple of weeks, now, then, as we've already looked at in Acts 28, he's in his own hired house there in Rome, and the Jews knew nothing about him. They hadn't received any report from Jerusalem. So there was no case. Now, we see there the providential hand of God, which, of course, was a great encouragement to Paul. It was a confirmation of his faith. Now, go over to uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy in your Bibles. 2 Timothy. Now, 2 Timothy is one of the pastoral epistles. And here Paul is writing to Timothy, um, his, uh, as he calls him, his own son in the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 4, that was in verses 6 to 8. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8, he said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which... The Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. And uh, love that verse. And you know, uh, the fervor and the faith of Paul was there until the end. 
You know, that's, uh, he wrote the pastoral epistles about 67 AD. The prison epistles were 61, 62 AD around there, between 60 and 62 AD. And so uh, Paul had been released. He went off and kept serving the Lord uh, for another five or so years. He's arrested again. And this time he knows. It doesn't say that the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, or anything else. But here we see Paul going, uh, I'm now ready to be offered. I'm, I'm fine. I'm ready to be offered. Look what he says. I have fought a good fight, finished my course, and what's the third one? I have kept the faith. Paul was a man of great faith and fervor, right to the end. And it didn't scare him when he came to the end of his life. He knew it was the end. You know, uh, that ought to be us too. And, and look, we're never going to live a life like Paul. Thank the Lord for that. Never going to live a life like Paul. But at the same time, God wants us to have great faith and, and, and fervor for Him. What's the fruit of the Spirit? What's the fruit of the Spirit that God sees in us? Faith, meekness, and temperance. Faith, meekness, and temperance. And Paul is certainly a great example of that. Now the third character, of course, is John. Now go over to John chapter 21. John 21. John 21. Look at verses 21 to 24. Now this is when Peter, uh, whom we were thinking about this morning, this is where the Lord got beside Peter. He got Peter to confess his love for him three times because he denied him three times. And, um, and so uh, after that was sorted, they're walking along the Sea of Galilee there. And, and uh, it says uh, in verse 20, uh, Then Peter, uh, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, which was John, following which also leaned upon his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that, be, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing, sorry, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Verse 24, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And so, uh, so here we, we see John uh, writing of himself. Of course, the Lord inspired him to write the Gospel of John. And, uh, and so what, is, what was John? John was the epitome of a model, born-again believer in respect of his character. Uh, there is no... There's no real correction in the Word of God. He didn't have a time like Simon Peter. Um, the only time that you can find uh, where John uh, was rebuked by the Lord was when uh, he and his brother uh, at the village of the Samaritans that wouldn't receive the Lord into the village. Uh, he and his brother said, well, Lord, would you have us to call down fire onto the village? And the Lord said, you don't know what spirit you're of. You know? And he, he corrected them and he, he rebuked them. But that was it. That was it. And, uh, and so... He, yeah, John became known as the disciple whom the Lord loved. That, that's a Philadelphia type love. Yeah, love of the brethren. He was that brotherly love. And, uh, and, and so the Lord had such a, a Philadelphia type love towards John. We see this in the Gospel account that John had, uh, the Lord had John write. Uh, the Lord had him record the words of John 13 verse 34, which says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another uh, as I have loved you, that ye love one, also love one another. Then in 1 John 4.19, uh, we love him because he first loved us. And that was very much John. You know, John's the only one uh, in the authors of the New Testament that, that wrote so much of the love of God. And uh, for those of you who, uh, when you were saved, if you, if you sat down and read the, uh, the Gospel of John, as one of the first books or the first book of the Bible that you read. Uh, I don't know about you, but it really affected me. You know, the love of God. And, uh, and you, can just, you can just 
it oozes out of the Gospel of John just how much the Lord loved him and how much it means to, to the Lord to have that close relationship. But you know, the thing that made John's relationship with the Lord, that brotherly love uh, type relationship so special was his character. You know, John truly had, uh, had been transformed by the renewing of his mind. Remember, he was a commercial fisherman with, with Peter and Andrew and James, um, John's brother. Now, commercial fishermen don't have a very good reputation for being nice people, or a bit rough, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, John became a man with obviously a very meek character, a humble character. And we can see that, 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 that the, Lord, the Lord's relationship with him because of that, and we'll think about that in a minute, but we can see because of, the, of his relationship with the Lord that John's character is something for us to desire. To be like John. You stop and think, when the Lord's on the cross, Mary, there was a few Marys standing there, some of the you know, ladies that were following the Lord, but Mary, the Lord's earthly mother, the one that was a chosen vessel to bear the Lord Jesus when he came into this earth, Mary was there. John, the beloved disciple, was there. The Lord looked down from the, looked down from the cross and he said to John, Behold thy mother. He said to Mary, Behold thy son. And it says, From that hour, John took her into his own home. Now, uh, culturally, when, uh, when uh, you know, say, for example, we know that uh, Joseph, as in uh, the Lord Jesus' earthly stepdad, uh, had died, we can see from studying the Word of God that Jesus then took the responsibility uh, for looking after his mother. You, you say, how do you know that? Well, you, you read the Word of God. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the wedding of Cana, uh, when the Lord turned the water into wine, uh, it says that, that Mary and the brethren were there, and then when they left, uh, the whole family followed Jesus. But, if you look at John 7, uh, they hadn't believed on him. It, it, it seems that, they, the, that his siblings, step-siblings, had not believed on the Lord until after the Lord died. And so, so we can see the Lord Jesus Christ taking responsibility for Mary. After the Lord went to the cross, rose again and ascended, uh, we can see that his, his siblings did believe on him because they were counted in amongst the, the, uh, the disciples there in Acts chapter uh, 1. In Acts chapter 1. But yet, the Lord didn't say to one of his step-siblings, oh, it's your, your, your next. You've got to look after Mary now. No, no, no. No, he, gave it. He, he got John to do it. That shows the relationship that, that John had in following and walking with his Lord and his Saviour. That speaks great volumes for his character. That speaks of meekness. That speaks of great faith. It speaks of uh, of faith, meekness and temperance in his life that the Lord did see. And you stop and think about it. Who was, who was one of the biggest characters in the, in the Bible, apart from people like Noah and so forth? Who did God give the first five books of the Bible to? No, uh, to Moses. To Moses. And why did God use him for what was one of the main things, that, what reasons why God used him? because he was the meekest man on earth at that time. His character was a big part of that. Yes, God had, God had gone, God had been putting through the refining fires. You know, he'd come out of the house of Pharaoh and, and, uh, and uh, you know, ended up in the wilderness for 40 years chasing sheep around to change his character. But by the time the Lord used him for the Exodus, Moses was the meekest man on earth. That was John too. God chooses those people with that meek character to do those the greatest things that God would have done in this world. You want God to use you? You need to ask God to strip away the pride and, and be meek and humble before Him. Because that's the, that's the kind of person that God can work with the most. Um, 
I just want to think of this. This is just a little interesting note to make a comparison between Moses and and and, uh, and John. I'm not, I'm not trying to put any any kind of uh, emphasis on this or, or trying to make anything out of it, but it's just a couple of observations. The Lord used Moses to record the first five books of the Bible, including the creation. Yeah, the creation was first. The Lord used John to record five books of the Bible, which included the end of the world and the new creation. So you're going to at the opposite ends. Uh, Moses and John at the opposite ends of the Bible. They both recorded five books. Uh, the Lord let Moses see the promised land from Mount Pisgah before he died. The Lord let John see the new heavens, new, earth, new Jerusalem and the new earth where he dwells righteous, will dwell righteousness forever. Um, John was a perfect example of what a Christian should be in character and in deeds. Similar to Moses, who was the meekest man at that time. Interesting. You might say, why don't I bring those things out? What you are as a born-again believer, your character, makes a huge difference to how much God can use you. If we think we've got it all worked out, then God can't use you. You've got to stop using your own noodle up here and let the mind of God lead and guide in your life. It doesn't mean you sit there and do nothing waiting for God to drop the golden egg out of the sky. It doesn't mean that at all. But at the same time, you, you know, if, you, if you have something on your heart, put it before the Lord and say, Lord, is this of you? Or is this just me thinking this? God lead and guide in this. Open or close the door. Lord, uh, speak to me through your scriptures. Give me peace of heart or don't let me be settled about it. Or if there's just something that's not, not right about it, just let it niggle me to where I can see that there's something not right. Or I just don't have that peace of heart. If you want God to have all of your life for his use, then you've got to give God all of your life. You've got to give God all of your heart. Now, um, I mentioned this this morning and we're going to go here again uh, in, to close off this evening. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Now, I would hope that by, by now you might be getting pretty close to knowing these verses off by heart, but Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 are such a vital, are such a, yeah, two vital verses for a born again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to break them down a little bit here for a moment. Before we, before we finish. Paul wrote then, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, stop and think about it. Surrender. Surrender is a willingness for the Lord to shape and mould us and give us confidence in our walk with Christ. That's Peter. Peter surrendered. Uh, it took a pretty dramatic effect, uh, event for that to happen, but it did. Let me say that again. Stop and think about it. Surrender is a willingness. You've got to be willing to really surrender or you're not going to. Simple and plain as that. You've got to be willing to surrender where... I'm pleased to take this to the extreme of thinking with what I'm saying here. Where you look at you just go, Lord, I'm just going to make a mess of my life if I just row my own boat. Uh, I just, I kind of give up. I give up my own will. I give up my own stubbornness. I give up my own, I've got this work out up here thinking, where I realise that God, I don't have it worked out. Because I don't know, Lord, what you've got on that course that you've set before me. So willingness, surrender is willingness for the Lord to shape and mould us and give us confidence in our walk with Christ. 
And it will, because when, when you surrender, and you truly surrender, and you see God work, because he's not hindered to, to lead you and guide you and to mould your life, uh, it does, it gives you confidence, because you know God's in control. Then also it says there, be not conformed to this world, in verse number 2 at the beginning. Being not conformed to this world is to be more Christ-like, which brings faith and zeal. One of the biggest hindrances we have in this, in this life is being Christ-like. Because our peers surround us and we don't want to be too different from them because otherwise they're kind of going to go... But the more you go, the more you think about one day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to care less what, the, what Joe Blow thought about me anymore. We need that thinking now. Who cares what they think? We need to be Christ-like. Be not conformed to this world. Don't be like this world. Don't follow the, 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 the speech, the fashions, the, the ideas, the actions, whatever, of this world. If it's not right before God, uh, give it the flick. Ask God to help you, and He will. He'll give you, he'll give you wisdom on how to overcome those things. And then when, when you get the victory over those things, with, when you get the victory over that thinking about being conformed to this world and, and you go the opposite way, in the right way, it, it gives you more faith and zeal, like Paul. I say, well, how so? Because when you see God give you the victory, when you see God give you the strength, when you see God give you the wisdom, you go, wow. And, and it does, it encourages you. you. You know that God's there, it builds your faith in Him, it builds your strength in Him. It gives you more desire to serve Him and to walk with Him. And then the third part, being transformed by the renewing of our minds. So transformed, like I said this morning, means changed. Renewing means like renovate, to renovate our minds. Brings a meek Christian showing the fruit of the Spirit. And that's John. That's John. You might say, well, how do you know that, that you know, being transformed by the renewing of your mind brings a meek, meek spirit? Well, if the Holy Spirit of God transforms your mind, then what else do you think you're going to be? Rude and, and arrogant? Of course not. You're going to be the opposite. But being transformed by the renewing of your mind, God will, God will humble you. God will transform your thinking. God will help you to control this thing a whole lot more. He renovates our minds. And, and it brings the fruit of the Spirit. And that's John. So in those verses we've just seen Peter, in Romans 12 verse 1 and 2, we've just seen Peter in the surrender. Uh, we've seen Paul and being not conformed to this world, but to be more Christ-like, which brings faith and zeal. And we've seen being transformed by the renewing of our minds uh, is John. So, you know, just to finish off, if we want to be busy about being part of God's eternal purpose, uh, yes, it's good to be like Peter, John and Paul. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, is your roadmap. Stop and think about it. In those verses contains the way to, to, to be at least part of their character. You may not, you may not reach the, the heights of meekness like John. You may not have the, the, the strong faith and zeal of Paul. And you, and you may not may not ever have the boldness and the confidence uh, like Peter. But at the same time, God will certainly transform you to what he wants you to be. And, and it's not how we start off when we're first saved. It's totally different. May the Lord, may the Lord just give you an encouragement in that this evening. You know? I know for myself... 
I don't want to be me. I don't want to be the old me. I want to be keeping on going forward that the Lord would continue to help me to get any, any of the old Peter out of there. Any of the old stubbornness. Any of the old self, selfishness. I want to be like Paul and have more faith and more zeal. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind, like John. You stop and think about it. God used him. He was the only disciple, the only apostle, the only one of the twelve that was not martyred. And, uh, you know, you can only put that down to his relationship with the Lord. He had a special job from God. He saw New Jerusalem. He saw the new heavens and the new earth, which obviously are still future tense. That speaks a lot for his character. That speaks a lot for his relationship with the Lord. So this afternoon, how is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Saviour? Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for those three men that we've looked at today. And Lord, uh, as we close, as we finish for, the, for another Lord's Day, thank you, Lord, for speaking to us through your word, the word of God. Lord, may you help us to grow, each and every one of us, me included, Lord, I, I know that our growth never stops until the day we stand in your presence. Father, I, I Lord, thank you for the Holy Spirit of God that lives and dwells within every born-again believer. Lord, may we be responsive. May we remember all of the things that you spoke to us through your word when we need to be reminded. Lord, may we have that willingness in our lives to to be moulded and shaped by you. May we have that great faith and zeal that we need as we look at the world today and where it's headed. And Lord, the need is greater than ever for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to go out. And Lord, may we have that meek and quiet spirit of John. Lord, that you can lead us and guide us to the fullest extent that you would have in our lives. Father, I thank you and I praise you for these things. I ask and pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. God well, bless you and good afternoon.